Good afternoon, everybody. Thursday afternoon at reInvent, we are the survivors, so everybody should be giving ourselves a good pat on the back and a round of applause. I hope, please, yes. It's called winning reInvent. I hope everybody did save a little bit of time for this conversation about DevSecOps and what it takes to culturally transform a uh, venerable company into modern ways of building and more importantly, securing software. Uh, my name is Clinton Herget. I'm the field CTO at Sneak. We are a developer security platform. We can go into a little bit of detail about what that means. Uh, the company is pronounced like a pair of sneakers or sneaking around. It's also an acronym, stands for So Now You Know. So now you know that much at least. Hopefully by the end of this hour, we'll all know a little bit more about implementing DevSecOps uh, in a traditional organization. As for me, I spent about 20 years building software for a living. Now I talk about building software for a living, and that is much, much easier. Uh, and I am joined uh, by my friend Dan No, who is the lead security engineer in the Cybersecurity Engineering and Risk Management uh, organization at REI. Dan, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, everyone. My name is Dan No. Um, I joined REI uh, about four and a half years ago. Um, for those that may not know what REI stands for, that's also an acronym uh, for Recreational Equipment, Inc. And um, we are a co-op and an outdoor retailer here in the United States. Um, prior to that, I spent four years over at Nordstrom, another retailer here in the US. And then prior to that, about nine years um, serving in the U United States Army as a cybersecurity operations officer. So I'm um, glad to be here to talk about our journey into DevSecOps uh, with Clinton here. Awesome, yeah, and I'm so excited to get into the details of that transformation that uh, you were really spearheading uh, over at REI. I think what we'll do first, uh, just to kind of define some terms so we're all on the same page here, but sort of what is Dex DevSecOps? How are we using that terminology? What does that mean when we're introducing security into uh, modern ways of building software? And then I'd love to dive you know, deep into the details of uh, how Dan uh, and his team accomplished that uh, over at REI. Um, so we're going to talk about sort of what makes modern software different. Why is DevSecOps uh, something that we need to think about in building our modern applications when we maybe didn't, you know, 10 uh, and, and, and more years ago? Why has application security uh, had to change as a result? And then we'll get into how REI built its developer security program. How, uh, in particular, were the cultural implications of that transformation managed over time? This is much more a talk about people and process than it is about tools and technology. Um, and then we'll talk about the future. How is REI thinking about some of those issues related to DevSecOps uh, moving forward? We'll leave some time for uh, audience Q&A at the end. Really want this to be as sort of as, as interactive as possible. Um, so I think from my perspective and, uh, you know, talking specifically about how we see the world uh, evolving uh, here at Sneak, look, obviously we wouldn't all be here at reInvent if DevOps hadn't changed our lives and the way we do our work one way uh, or another. The way we build software today is simply fundamentally different, and that's more than saying it's, you know, quantitatively different. Yes, there's more software, but it's also fundamentally developed and structured differently uh, than the software of yesterday. You know, it used to be we would build a release every few months, and we'd go through a very manual release process process of deploying that, you know, out into production uh, with a lot of, you know, uh, manual stop gates involved. Uh, today we do agile development. We deploy every few minutes. We have continuous integration pipelines and automated tools that do a lot of that undifferentiated heavy lifting for us. We used to have siloed developers and operations teams, and we recognized that by integrating those teams together into these DevOps centers of excellence or into integrated platform teams within organizations, we could build software much, much uh, more quickly. Because if we integrate the operation of a particular application or service into the team that builds it, those teams can then run out ahead. They're no longer bottlenecked by the operation side of the house. So by building and maintaining software as part of this continuous infinite loop, we can unlock a lot of innovation and potential. And, of course, the way we define the requirements of software has changed. We no longer have these rigid uh, waterfall-based requirements documents where we have to decide every aspect of user interaction before a piece of software is built. We define the software as we build it as part of these rapid, agile, iterative cycles where we can make changes in real time. And again, that allows uh, things like microservice transformation. We break down monoliths into microservices to allow teams building individual features to run out much further ahead because they own that entire application sort of cradle to grave. And then finally, and most importantly, I think from a risk perspective, we no longer deal with very limited and visible software supply chains. You know, it used to be in the olden days, uh, everybody building software for an organization 
basically worked in the same building. And they deployed every few months onto servers that often were in the basement of that building. That's a very easy supply chain to understand. Now, obviously, we have these nearly infinite cloud-based uh, software supply chains because we have things like containers, things like open source dependencies, these massive application uh, graphs, but to say nothing of the third-party services and the cloud providers that are providing a lot of that agility. So software risk fundamentally looks different today uh, than it did even just a few years ago. What hasn't necessarily kept pace is security, the way we uh, implement the risk management of that software. Traditional application security relies on, on testing after or testing the artifact of a software uh, development process rather than testing the process itself, continuously testing as part of the act of building software. Uh, it's generally audit-based, right? It generates a big PDF or a result saying here's everything that you did wrong as opposed to being a fixed-based or iterative approach that allows developers to continuously build better. Uh, it relies on sort of siloing, right? We have to secure our application and then secure the cloud environment that it goes into independently of each other without recognizing that risk often is holistic. We need to understand the security implications of an application holistically by looking at multiple factors of context across that SDLC. And finally, traditional AppSec relies on security being a bottleneck, on being sort of the office of no, and, and, and siloing that knowledge in a handful of security experts within an organization, rather than farming out that knowledge, relying on developers to be security champions, embedding that software risk knowledge within the teams that are building that software. So when we talk about DevSecOps, we're talking about sort of the right-hand side of this diagram. What is a developer-first approach to security in precisely the same way that we made operations developer-first by integrating it into the process of building software? Okay, y'all have heard me talk enough. I think we've defined the landscape of what we mean by DevSecOps. I really want to dig in with you, Dan, to find out how is this implemented at REI. And you're talking about an 85-year-old retailer. Uh, you said you're about four years into this journey now. What did that landscape look like when you were on the ground, and what was the relationship like between the builders of software and the assessors of risk when you arrived? Yeah, that's a good question. So I arrived at REI four years ago, and um, essentially we actually didn't have a uh, an official application security program, um, and our security department was pretty much siloed off from our what we call our digital retail mm -hmm. team. Um, they were the ma main consumers that were developing software, uh, microservices, and managed our website, REI.com. Um, so when we got there, um, I suddenly realized that, hey, within, within our with our software development program, there, there really wasn't any kind of security knowledge um, per se. Uh, we definitely had a lot of developers um, within REI that, that really championed security though. So that was a very encouraging, encouraging thing. Um, when there were no official security tools like for SCA or SAS or software composition analysis, stack code analysis, um, a lot of that depended upon like open source tooling. Um, so one of the funny things that I, when I came in, I, was, uh, I asked some of the developers, oh, what do you do for security? And he said, um, well, we don't really have anything um, scanning our code or looking at dependencies, but we do have this thing in Sonar Cube. It, it scans our code, but there's no gates. There, it just gives us a report and we don't really take a look at it. Um, similar to that, uh, they also um, used OWASP Dependency Checker, which was an open source tool. Mm -hmm. So there was some efforts in there, and there were some engineers and developers that, that had, the, um, had the security mindset, but they, they implemented a tool, but didn't really have the knowledge of like, what, is, what are the results supposed to be? What are we supposed to do with these results? Um, and really, from a, on a security side of things, um, we were very much on the, I would say, right side of protecting in runtime. So we did have a web application firewall, bot protection, things to protect our website um, after things were in production. So, mm -hmm. um, but to your point, a lot of the um, areas where we could have improved upon was on the application development side. So that way we can identify the problems earlier and make sure that it doesn't get introduced um, in production. 
That problem you mentioned of developers saying, yeah, we have security tools in place, but we don't really look at the results, right? Or that's there because of a compliance reason, or somebody said we had to integrate that into our pipeline, but it's not ours. We don't own it. We don't actually get any value from it. Um, how did you sort of go about handling those objections? I mean, do you have any particular uh, horror stories concerning that, that initial recognition of like, hey, actually, wait a minute, even though we say we're doing security, it's not actually integrated into the way our engineers are approaching their jobs on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, I wouldn't say we had like any particular horror stories um, starting out in, uh, four years ago. Um, I think from my perspective is that uh, the one thing, I think Log4j was definitely an interesting mm -hmm. time for that. Um, just trying to get an idea from a security perspective, like what, what, what kind of software is out there, where is Log4j actually implemented? That was a, initially a hard time for discovery. Fortunately, we had some other tooling and we had a very engaged developer community to help us understand um, how their applications were um, structured. Mm -hmm. So we were able to tackle that problem, but we didn't have an overall visibility from a security perspective, like a tooling to give us that, that robust reporting. And so it was a very onerous process to track down and remediate um, and to understand what, what actually had that uh, dependency problem. Yeah, and when I think back, you know, uh, looking at four years ago, I'm sure you were also doing a cloud migration at the same time, right, as part of a larger effort at digital modernization. Mm -hmm. How did the security conversations fit into the way you approach developers uh, when it came to saying, hey, now we want you to take ownership of all of these additional pieces, right? You were probably moving to things like containerization, infrastructure as code, and so forth at the same time. Um, what was that relationship like between the, the sort of crowd, cloud migration piece on the one hand and modernizing your security on the other? And how did those interact? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, that also, four years ago, starting out off of there, we, we actually were just also starting our cloud security program as well. Mm -hmm. um, I would say four years ago, um, our cloud migration wasn't really fully implemented. Um, we were just starting um, with an effort to move most of our microservices and our, our website over into AWS. Um, so that was the first initial big push of it. Um, with that, um, there was definitely security in mind as we, as we were moving out of our data center. Um, and I think what started out was the initial utilizing cloud native solutions like uh, Guard Duty, um, Security Hub, to be able to help us gain an understanding of the risks that are in the cloud environment. Um, but again, um, at, as I came in, that, that started initially naturally within the cloud engineering team, mm -hmm. uh, which was a very good encouraging thing. And then as I came in, we began understanding the problem set, the environment, um, and then um, really just um, starting that cloud security journey, um, eventually moving in, into like cloud security posture management, yeah. other tooling. Um, and I, I would say like going ahead now, um, we have moved our, in, our website into AWS and um, going forward um, with our next three year journey is, is to actually complete our cloud migration journey. Um, by moving out of our data center. So. Yeah, and I'd love to get into that uh, a little bit more, maybe a little later. What I'm particularly interested in, though, you kind of made uh, references to a bunch of other teams. You have cloud engineering, you have platform engineering that are uh, all on some level designed to enhance the developer experience kind of within the organization. Yeah. But I think when we, when we think about DevSecOps transformation, it's never as simple as buying a bunch of tools, right, or procuring a bunch of open source and slapping them all together. It really has to be sort of a, a cultural transformation involving people and process. So, you you know, we've, we've got the lay of the land. You had these very disparate relationships between sort of software de development on one hand, security on the other. Um, how did you get that initial buy-in? What were some of the stories that you had to tell to developers to kind of get their initial excitement level up about, you know, what on some level could sound like you're asking them to take on a bunch of additional responsibility in addition to their day-to-day -day job? Like, how did you kind of ease that transition in mindset for them? Yeah, so what, one of the interesting things is uh, when I first started REI, um, again, starting four years ago, was uh, I was hired into um, the security organization. However, um, in order to address that problem and for security to understand our platform engineering, our developer community, and cloud engineering teams, um, 
I, I was actually embedded with our SRE, our platform engineering team, mm -hmm. um, to, to better understand the processes, how are they deploying their code, how are they building their pipelines. Um, so in a way, um, getting a very good understanding of, of how things worked within our digital realm at REI. Because prior to that, um, I would say our security team was very segmented off. Again, we are very policy focused. Um, much more into what I would say like our enterprise security environment with endpoints um, and um, email protection, things like that. But starting off there, in order for us to like gain that trust with the developer, development community and the platform community, um, is, was really like we said, hey, Dan's going to go and be part of SRE like 50% of his time. He's not actually going to be in the security engineering team. Um, and so for me, that, that was very, very helpful. Um, I was able to just embed with them and as an engineer, help contribute to like code, understand how microservices work, understand how a infrastructure engineer um, did their work. Um, and then from there, it was kind of like that building of trust, to then come in this, um, introduce more security concepts to them. Um, and so, so yeah. That's, that's how we started that. That's a huge investment, though, right? To take someone like you and say 50% of your time is going to be embedded with one of these uh, platform SRE teams. Um, I, I would imagine maybe that created a little bit of friction uh, internally, but I could also imagine that from the engineering perspective, to be able to hear from someone who has done their day-to-day -day work, right? Who's had the experience of actually getting, you know, the, the Black Friday push uh, done into production, um, yeah. probably was able to build some trust within those organizations that like, hey, security gets it because they've actually been down here in the trenches with us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, 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 was, that was definitely the intent and that's, um, I think, the result that, that really happened. And really it was like also with that, we were able to better understand the requirements. So um, kind of stepping back is when we finally decided to start an application security program, initially what occurred was we did try to push a different static analysis um, scanning uh, toolkit from the security side. However, because of that divide and that gap of not understanding their process, we actually had a vendor um, we tried to say, hey, here's a SAS scanning tool. Um, we want to start scanning our code. We want to be proactive in it. Um, come to find out the developer community pushed back and said hey, there was tons of friction. They said, this doesn't even work in mm -hmm. our Jenkins pipeline. Can't even integrate it. What, what are we doing? <laughs> what is security doing? Do they even understand our process? Um, and so that, that really took back. And so now, going forward, I spent about a year or two, I would say, embedded with those teams and then understanding, from my perspective, I, I gained a lot of knowledge on how does Jenkins work, how does, uh, how does CIC, how do, how do CIC pipelines work. Um, and from there, we re kind of restarted our AppSec program. And then from there, we, we actually invited the developers and architects to say, all right, we're going to restart this journey. Um, what are some of the requirements? We want to bring you along due to POCs, POVs. Um, and, and really work together on securing our application environment. It turns out, yeah, when you actually get the developer's hands on a tool that you're thinking about procuring that is going to impact their workflow, they're ultimately more likely to adopt it if they've had a chance to really you know, put it through its paces ahead of time, right? Because I think the way we interact with tools as engineers is just fundamentally different than the way that might look to other stakeholders in the organization. And that can unveil either a lot of friction or a lot of potential uh, chance to collaborate, right, and increase that mm -hmm. velocity. I'm also especially interested in the role of sort of the, the platform team in the organization. Because I think as we, as we go down this story of uh, you know, how DevOps has, has really shifted our thinking over the last 10 years or so, there was initially this rush of excitement, right, to say, well, now teams are going to own everything about their service, and they can choose their own tech stack, and they can build their own pipelines. And what happened, right, organizations ended up with thousands of Jenkins pipelines without a lot of management, uh, at least visibility, into what are they even doing? Do we have the right security controls in place? And at least what I've seen is the uh, reaction to that being creating these sort of centers of excellence or platform teams to build paved roads for developers, mm -hmm. which is important not just from the 
uh, security perspective of getting that risk oversight and ensuring that there's some level of commonality in what all those teams are doing while still embracing DevOps philosophy, but also doing that in a way that uh, is, is congruent with what we want from a positive developer experience, right? Which is reducing the cognitive load, uh, le shortening the feedback loops as much as possible, and ultimately keeping developers in their flow state, right? So they can actually be doing what we hired them to do rather than constantly be playing ping pong back and forth mm -hmm. with AppSec. So did that team become sort of an ally in uh, projecting that uh, narrative for DevSecOps throughout the organization? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think our, our platform engineering team, internally um, we, we call them, uh, we, we give outdoor names to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. our, our, Alpine, <laughs> our Alpine team, um, um, which was, is basically our, our platform engineering team, uh, really was a, were champions and were really our allies in implementing a lot of the tools and application security. So they gave me a lot of insight, um, a lot of feedback into how to integrate within pipelines, how to, how to modify our, what we call crampon framework uh, um, to better um, be secure and to help, um, help those developers. So um, within REI, for a lot of our site, um, we utilize this crampon framework as a standard, like a, like a golden path, a happy path, so that developers would have a, a, a really standard set of libraries, a mm -hmm. standard set of um, deployment mechanisms into, into AWS, um, so that way a developer can just focus on developing their features, developing the core, the, the code, and then rely on this core framework of crampon and um, our deployment mechanism called, called Sherpa <laughs> to, to really deploy a, a container um, and microservice into ECS. Um, so yeah, just a, I, I, I totally agree. Like during that, um, that whole entire transformation over at REI within the last, I would say it, two years that, that really started where we actually created a platform engineering, a center of excellence and really coalescing around that. Um, that was immensely helpful, and then from security, we can have, just have focus on that that core platform to yeah. implement guardrails and and our tooling. And I think that's such an important concept, right, is what do we need to do to enable security to move past the concept of being gatekeepers, right, being the office of no within the organization, and really turn them into creators of guardrails, right? They're sort of building the road, they're, they're defining where the road goes. Platform engineering builds the road, and then developers drive on it, right? Mm -hmm. At least for, you know, roughly the 80% part of the problem. Although that does leave sort of the 20%, and what happens when you've got a team that really believes they are a special snowflake, right, and they say, here, Here's why we don't want to drive on the paved road. Like, what was your strategy for handling some of those objections within the organization for you know people who maybe didn't want to necessarily play nice with that platform vision? Um, that that is a good question. We we do have one or two of those mm -hmm. <laughs> type of programs. I would say we, we we're still taking that uh, approach um, of I would say they're outside of the, the our regular um, Alpine process, mm -hmm. um, but really engaging with those teams those those teams um, on understanding what, how, are de how is it that they're deploying code and how, are they are, how they're developing within AWS. Um, but it's really, if they have that special, special like deviation from the platform, um, we're still trying to figure out the, uh, the right process to really do that. Um, and just as an example, like for Sneak, for example, I'll, I'll use that is we've onboarded a core of our Alpine platform and all the microservices that fall underneath it. Um, going into the future though, it's like considering what, how, how, do we, how do we implement to our merchandising teams that also develop code, some of our internal teams, mm -hmm. um, our mobile application team um, for our mobile app, how do we integrate that into Sneak? Um, and that's a process and journey where it's like, I'm sitting down with the, the team to just understand what they're doing. Yeah. Um, but we don't have like a very like hard enforcement saying, you must go into this platform. Sure. But yeah. Well, ultimately, at the end of the day, we're engineers, right? We want the carrot and not the stick. We want to yeah. understand, what do I get from doing that? And typically, what you get is, well, a lot less friction, as long as you're staying within this realm of controls that we've already implemented at the platform level, while understanding that there are always exceptions, right? You want yeah. to remain flexible enough to not get that sort of reputation, uh, again, as the, as the department of no.
Yeah. The, one of the other problems that tends to come up in these circumstances, um, obviously there's the sort of friction issue, but then there's also kind of an ownership and attribution problem, right? You're understanding that we've got all these services, we've got, I would assume, a, a pretty large amount of legacy code for an 85-year-old company, especially mm -hmm. as a retailer. Um, and when you say we're going to devolve this responsibility to teams or we're going to you know, move from the, the hub to the spokes of the wheel, that can sometimes leave out critical areas of responsibility, right? So how do you deal with maybe those services Services that are running in production that don't have clear ownership or that you don't necessarily understand who owns that responsibility, particularly from the, the one thing that you can't actually shift out to the spokes, which is sort of the, the risk uh, appetite of the organization. Yeah, I, I think to answer that question, um, I, there is a good example. So as we moved, um, as we started moving into AWS, um, we, we were starting to also decompose our monolith. Mm -hmm. um, our, the, our, our website used to be a complete monolithic application. Um, as we started doing that, uh, that, was, that became a little bit easier um, internally. As, as we started splitting out into microservices, we, we intentionally identified a team, we identified an owner. Um, so, and internally, we, we knew who the developers and back-end, front-end engineers were for, for the microservices as we did that. However, during the migration, we still have pieces of, of code and mm -hmm. services and functions in our monolithic application. So this monolith is still there. However, when issues arise, there, there is no ownership. Right. Um, so it, it's interesting to tackle it because then when a security issue arises for myself, uh, I look at it and I see like, oh, there's a dependency issue in the, in the monolith. Um, it relates to this, um, micro, uh, this like function within the monolith, like who owns it, and, no one, and everyone's like, I, I don't own it, it's not me. Uh, so one of the things I've, I've sort of tackled and, um, is I, because I, I've started to gain more experience within like, our, our application security process and, and how we develop code, uh, and using Sneak as well, um, is when I do see an issue, I'm able to actually go in our monolith, find a dependency, and kind of myself commit that <laughs> into it. it. It's almost, I would say, in my words, like chaos engineering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because as, as, as that change is going, they see a, a myself committing code, and then it's like, hey, security is doing something in, in, within our, uh, the monolithic application. Uh, we should take a look at that. Um, so it's not a perfect answer of saying like, okay, we definitely find an owner for this. But then I say for a lot of unknown things, our, like our security team will take that initiative to, to make the change and push the change. Mm -hmm. And the development community um, takes notice of that because they may have a dependency on that feature or, the, or suddenly someone who's been working on that realizes, hey, like security pushed a change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're like, and then the other thought that comes into our mind is like, oh, well, wow, security is actually committing code into our application. And that, that, that to them, that, that takes a lot of, um, that gets a lot of attention. So. I've got to say, I've never heard that solution to the problem before, right? <laughs> like if security becomes the default owner, I think you find ownership uh, chains pretty quickly yeah. uh, within engineering. Um, so that's, that's uh, especially interesting. Uh, I got to ask though, sort of, um, are you thinking about any kind of frameworks of adoption or tooling around sort of uh, explicit lineage of software? That's been a big buzzword recently as we think about how can we track, given that we're in this uh, cloud native world of, uh, uh, almost impenetrably opaque, you know, uh, software supply chains, um, being able to identify even something as simple as, you know, who's the owner of a particular repo, and then how does that end up in a container that ultimately ends up in a production pod uh, in our infrastructure, uh, which could be as simple as adopting best practices like code owners files, but there's also frameworks like Salsa and others that have been gaining a lot of traction. Are you looking in any directions like that to, to make that sort of thing more explicit, uh, if only for yourself, so you're not doing so many late night commits? Uh, no, that, 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 that is a good point, actually. I do like that. And um, I think we, at REI, we've been actually modernizing a lot of our um, tech stack behind the scenes. So um, I do see code owners as a possible solution to that um, as we mature our program and then as we go into there. So, mm -hmm. um, but to, to answer your question on that, um, no, I, 
um, I actually haven't looked at a certain type of framework to be able to help manage that, but mm -hmm. that, that's a good suggestion. Uh, well, I think that's a good segue, because what I would love to hear more about sort of is as you approach 2024, um, I don't think any organization on earth would say we are a mature DevSecOps uh, organization. There's always new things to learn. There's always sort of a next step. Um, but given that you're four years into this journey now, what do you see as that sort of logical next set of steps that you're looking at over roughly the next year or so on uh, your, your DSO roadmap? Um, so yeah, I think over the next year, um, actually, is what I came to the realization as we went through this journey is REI, we are not, at, not only just a retailer um, that um, sells outdoor gear, but we, we manage a website, we manage mobile applications. We have a very, very robust, um, very creative uh, team that manages the website. Um, so again, as I mentioned earlier before, we had we created our own like kind of software framework with Crampon, um, and and we have some very incredible engineers that that manage the platform behind the scenes with REI. So in a way, REI also has and it's like a own mini software company. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Crampon framework is also versioned, and so that Crampon framework has a ton of transitive dependencies and dependencies that are libraries on it, open source libraries on its own. Um, so, so the next on the journey is really taking a look at understanding, okay, what does it look like to do like monthly updates or monthly version updates to our, mm -hmm. our crampon framework? How do, we, how do we get our application teams to consistently or, or in a more programmatic way to update their crampon, their crampon library? Yeah. Um, and so, so that way it's not like a, just a major update and that way we can keep pace with open source vulnerabilities um, with the libraries and out of date libraries. So yeah, that, that, that to me is like in the near term for, for the next year journey um, in, in, in maturing that. So that way, yeah, if it, the other thing is, is also we recently have done a bug bounty program. So <laughs> um, that, that's really a, a big win and a good way to start highlighting and and giving developers a more of a awareness of security vulnerabilities um, within within their application, um, and so with NetNext, you're tying that with thing tooling like Sneak, um, and so it kind of pushes that to keep them more aware um, to to maintain their their code. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting analogy, right? We're now, what, 15 years into this concept of software eating the world. Every company is now a software company, but there's almost an additional layer of abstraction where now these platform teams uh, inside almost become software companies within software companies, right? Because yeah. they are building the tooling that other developers are relying on. And so, you know, we're seeing this model more and more where you almost need to build out explicit uh, SLAs and expectations as if you're dealing with external customers because you are now in the critical path for every other team that is building on top of that sort of paved road. Um, has there been any, uh, uh, I, I guess, sort of cultural uh, backlash from that or when it comes to even things like writing documentation or how you handle dependencies internally when you can have maybe one team that's managing a library that's utilized by hundreds or thousands of other services that if it were to go down would cause tremendous business uh, disruption. Um, I guess, how are you dealing with that, especially coming from the days of a monolith where everybody's maintaining sort of the same code base that doesn't have a lot of really explicit ownership when ultimately things you know, might, might get in trouble? Yeah, so I guess that ties back to like a really close relationship with our platform engineering team right. and with Crampon. Um, and so within that, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, when we first introduced Sneak, for instance, um, a lot of developer, we had office hours um, mm -hmm. on like helping developers address their um, open source vulnerabilities and dependencies. And a lot of them came back saying like, hey, like these, these dependencies, these libraries, they're not necessarily tied to us, they're tied to, to cramp on. Um, and they, they were a little bit wary that, hey, eventually if security decides to put up a gate and enforcement and say like, no, if you have critical vulnerabil vulnerabilities in our dependencies, you're gonna block us, but it's not our fault because we're utilizing this cramp on version. Um, 
And so I think we, we, we now have like a deprecation policy, we have mm -hmm. SLAs, um, and we're working towards defining like what is that minimum crampon version or what is that minimum right. framework version and communicating that out to developers so that they, they understand that they need to be on a certain like minimum version of our internal tooling. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think that that's how we're we're kind of addressing that right now. Yeah, um, what what sort of goes into as you think about constructing that roadmap, whether that's on an annual basis or however you sort of chunk it out? Uh, how do you measure success? How do you really understand where you're at? How do you think holistically about where are the gaps in our uh, developer security program? What what might we need to bring in next, either from a tooling perspective, a process perspective, or ultimately where are we at on that cultural change and what is the readiness of the organization to maybe accept new responsibilities, new ways of thinking? Like if you zoom way out, what are some of your metrics? for deciding sort of where you're at and, and, and what comes next? Um, so, so some of the metrics that I look at is like uh, mean times for remediation is usually mm -hmm. the um, one that we would, would measure to be able to say like, okay, um, what is that mean time to remediation when a, when a development team gets a finding? How long does it take to resolve criticals? How long does it take mm -hmm. to do, resolve highs? The critical and high severities are, are usually what, what we take to do that. Um, at, as we start to reduce that mean time to remediation, we understand that, hey, teams are starting to like, take security a little bit more seriously. They're integrated into their, into their JIRA, into their sprints. Um, and then when we look at tooling, it, it really depends as, as a next step is like, okay, if we introduce like DAST, for instance, um, Will that reduce and will that surface up and is the team ready like, to, to take on some of those yep. additional findings? Um, that, that's actually similar to how we actually also did our bug bounty program. Um, we, we didn't take it public for a while because we wanted to make sure that we had a good cadence, that teams had a good process, right. to be able to address the, the findings from a bug bounty program in a timely manner. And so looking at that, that's, a, that's one of our key metrics is, is mean time to remediation. Yeah, because there's a huge uh, uh, balance that you have to strike here, right? Between you want to get developers the right information at the right time, but with the necessary context to understand it, right? And if you're just dumping undifferentiated alerts, particularly from a tool or a process that runs further to the right, and you're not integrating it into their day-to-day -day ways of working, you're sort of doing everything wrong from a developer experience perspective, right? You're getting them out of their flow state, you're adding to their cognitive load, you're increasing the feedback loop. And that, I think, mitigates really the core currency you're dealing with, which is developer trust, right? You want your engineers to say, I have confidence that the security program is pointing me in the right direction and giving me everything I need to be able to make the right decision the first time around, rather than to have to guess, right? And only find out later that there's a critical bit of context that you weren't aware of mm -hmm. because it wasn't integrated into correlating all of that information together. And it just came as the sort of you know, endless stream of what, 900 page PDFs that we've all sort of had to deal with. Yeah. So I, I wonder like, as you think more broadly, like past the next 12 months, do you have sort of a North Star in mind? Like what would success look like to cause you to say, hey, I think we have implemented as much as we can of this DevSecOps cultural shift and I'm, and I'm proud of where we at. Like, do you have any sense of, of where your utopia would be so that you would know, hey, I think we're really doing this right? I think, uh, yeah, my North Star would be if we had, it was, it's just basically if we, the process is complete. So like mm -hmm. from, if, it would, if a finding or security issue does arise, um, I think if a developer is able to get that understanding, that context within a system that they're used to working. So like mm -hmm. take Jira, for example, if, if there's a process where finding comes in, um, a developer gets it, in, in, an issue just arises within their Jira board, um, and they're able to contextualize, understand the problem, get that prioritized, and move it forward, and, and implement that within uh, our defined SLAs, mm -hmm. then that to me is a success, um, to be able to just timely address those vulnerabilities. Um, so yeah, just piggybacking off that, like the, again, the mean time to remediation is, is one of those, those things. So like, we have our own set of SLAs internally for criticals, highs, mediums, lows. 
And I would say like if every category, were, if, if a team, application team were able to meet a remediation of security issues within the defined SLAs, even all the way down to a low finding, that, that would mean that we have a very robust process and a very good trust between security and the development team to like address any kind of security issue. Um, so, so yeah, going through that. Um, I think our, in our journey, um, and I shared with this with you earlier, was it kind of made me a little bit uh, happy, encouraged, um, where there was a, we have a Slack channel for deployments, um, and there, there was a deployment recently, and someone said, hey, I'm deploying a fix um, to, to our application because Sneak said it was a problem. <laughs> and I was like, oh, someone actually looked at Sneak. <laughs> <laughs> and and they actually credited Sneak in our security tooling to say, all right, um, I'm taking this and uh, I'm gonna deploy it because um, I recognize that this is the issue and this is a problem. So, um, so that was an encouraging sign and, and I hope to see more. Well, of now it. when I heard that story originally, this happened on a very particular day, right? Oh, yeah, I think it was like close to like Cyber Monday. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I was like, oh, wow, well, yeah, you're gonna deploy on a, okay. <laughs> Well, we're glad that went well. Uh, but I, I do think that that speaks to the point of not just understanding that your SLAs are met from an application security perspective, but that also the engineers are able to implement those fixes at their DevOps velocity and at scale because, you know, let's face it, their day job is not to respond to tickets from you, right? It's yeah. not to constantly be worried about the risk management of the software. It's actually to build features. It's to innovate. It's to get user stories into production to ultimately move the enterprise forward. The question is how do we do that at scale while ensuring we have adequate visibility of all the risk. And so I think that makes sense as a North Star and, and hopefully your engineering and your platform uh, colleagues are sharing in that while also recognizing that you know, they've got an, an entirely different set of incentives you know, that they're motivated by, uh, motivated by at the same time. Yeah. So I think we're, we're getting down to the last uh, maybe third of the hour here. I'd love to open it up if anyone in the audience has questions. Uh, well, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to everybody for coming out today, learning more about DevSecOps. Again, we are Sneak, developer security platform uh, covering sort of the entire modern application stack from code, open source, container, and infrastructure as code security, moving rapidly into the application security posture management space. If you are interested in hearing more about Sneak, please don't hesitate to come see us at the booth for I think the next uh, couple hours at least, uh, or sneak.io if uh, you're interested in learning more. Um, we are also available, of course, on the AWS marketplace. Very proud to have integrations with things like AWS Code Build, Security Lake, EKS, and probably a dozen other AWS services uh, that I'm forgetting. Really important partnership for us moving forward. Thank you to our friends here at Amazon for giving us the time. And thank you to Dan for a great conversation about DevSecOps. All right. Thanks, Clinton. All right. Thanks, everybody, for making the time.